Hello and welcome to the North Seattle College Art Gallery's Virtual Visiting Artist Lecture Series. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the North Seattle College Art Gallery, and I teach uh, drawing and printmaking in the art department at the college. I'm lucky to work with Claire Hargley, who's my uh, assistant in the gallery, Karen Stildreyer, who's hovering for her today, and Mark, Anne, and Maddie, the gallery work study students. Uh, this is the third of our visiting artist lectures for the 2023-2024 school year, and we're thrilled to have artist Grace Gonzalez with us today. I want to tell you early on that we have live transcript available for those of you who want it. It can be turned on by clicking the show subtitle button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. For those of you who don't want it or find it distracting, you can turn it off by clicking the hide subtitle button. Use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we want to be sure that we have it for those who need it. We normally start these lectures with a land acknowledgement, but our institution is not doing official rote land acknowledgements until further notice as college leaders sit down with the area tribal leaders to discuss a meaningful way to acknowledge and the importance of what it means to be settlers, as well as occupiers, descendants, and inheritors of a system which sought to eradicate the original caretakers of this land. We are nothing without these folks, and we want to build a society where we are thoughtful about how we show that we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty, cultural heritage, and lives of Native, Indigenous, and First Nations people. Support them in our actions and have these words be meaningful. We want to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the U.S. from the African continent, and we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary forced and prison labor contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country in response to racial injustice and generations of structural racism against Black and Indigenous people and other communities of color. I will share my screen, and I'm sharing my screen to show you the work that we are doing to go from acknowledgement to deed. We know that it's not enough to just give a hollow acknowledgement and have to be sure that we are taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the NSC Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. And you can see an image of Grace's beautiful mural at the bottom. Last week, we opened a new show in the NSC Art Gallery. It's called Quotidian Queer, curated by artist and NSC alumna Jessica Marie Mercy. This show is up until March 1st, and we hope you take the time to come and see it. Gallery hours are Monday through Thursdays. 11 to 5 p.m. and Fridays 11 to 2 p.m. Our next virtual visiting artist lecture is with Ilana Zueshi on uh, Monday, March 4th, and that's the same time, 12 to 1. On March 11th, we will have a dedication for Kalina Chung's Percent for Art project at noon. On April 18th, there'll be a grand opening celebration for, for the renovated library. There's a lot coming up to celebrate at school. You can also check uh, our Facebook, Instagram, our website, and flyers around campus to find out what's going on in the gallery and who will be talking and when. We also urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of nearly all of the over 30 talks to date. We will post our links in the chat. Uh, you can sign up for emails by contacting us at nscartgallery at seattlecolleges.edu. I want to remind you that the NSC Art Gallery is nothing without support from the college, student leadership, and from all of you. Thank you for the help that you have given to the gallery by coming to these events and sharing them with people that you know who might enjoy them. Keep visiting the gallery, stopping in to say hello, and building the art gallery community. Thank you. And on to the reason that we are all here, I will hand you on to Kelda Martinson, who will introduce our speaker, Grace Gonzalez. Kelda teaches print, book arts, drawing, art business, the mural class, and other classes in the NSC art department. Thank you, Amanda. As Amanda said, I teach mural art here at North, and so I 
wanted to just pipe in with the introduction of Grace because I had the privilege of working with her so much last year. So here we are. Grace Gonzalez is a lucid dreamer and thinker and an extraordinary artist whose sense of the spiritual and the earthbound transcends gouache and watercolor applications to become something more, something pulsing, alive, and full of story. Her surreal works celebrate the connections we hold with each other and the natural world, I said in her statement. Grace also states stories are how we make sense of the world and each other. It was my great pleasure to work closely with Grace on the 2023 campus mural, Blooms of Change, which you can find on the southeast corner of the OCE and E building here on campus. From her statement, Grace also states that she hopes to engage the public with a mythology that allows for hope in ambiguity and comfort in change. Grace earned her Bachelor of Science in Industrial Design at Western Washington University and has shown her work at Nimoto and Geheim Galleries as well as her public work here at North Seattle College and for the city of Tukwila. Grace now lives and works in Seattle. I love the world of Grace Gonzalez. I appreciate her art and everything I see coming out of her studio. So I'm just really excited to be here today. Grace, it's just an honor. So thank you so much for coming and you can take it away when you're ready. All right, um, hi. I'm Grace Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Kelda, for introducing me. Um, and then just thank you to North Seattle College for providing me this opportunity. I still feel very much in my beginnings. Um, so this wasn't something that I really pictured for myself at this point in my life, but to have this chance to share my story and the stories that I like to tell is something that um, I appreciate a lot. And I'll just take it away. I just kind of want to start off with my background. Art is something that I've done my entire life. I don't remember a time where I haven't been drawing or doodling or sketching in the corners of school worksheets or anything like that. But being an artist is something that I actually never considered pursuing until very recently. It felt very much like something that other people did. I think that when I was first looking at colleges, I briefly looked at art schools and I saw how expensive they were. And I just kind of decided that, okay, I guess that's not for me. And instead, yeah, I went to school for industrial design, which for those of you that don't know, this is some of the work that I did in that program, uh, industrial design or product design is basically just the design of any product you can think of from sinks to chairs to computer monitors. And I was trying to be practical in this choice. It felt creative, but I'm someone that kind of tends towards wanting security. So this felt like the secure decision. Um, and the program that I chose at Western was actually an incredibly competitive program. So I didn't really have a lot of time to second guess that choice. I was kind of thrown into just kind of working incredibly hard, harder than I've ever worked in my life at that point. And that program, it was um, you get accepted into a pre-major, only 24 people get accepted into a pre-major. And then that sophomore year, you're just building a portfolio, you have a review at the end, and only 12 people get into the actual major. So it was just a lot of all-nighters and stress and pressure. And funnily enough, despite it being the not art decision, it was probably the best choice I could have made for my art because all of that feeling and all of that stress just kind of led to me needing some sort of sanctuary or peace of mind, and I shifted it completely into, yeah, I, I just started creating a lot of art all the time. And I started keeping these sketchbooks where I would just commit to filling every page. And if I didn't like what I did, I would cover it up and do it again. And it was just where I put all of the confusion that I was feeling and you can kind of see <laughs> how in these beginning pieces, 
there was just a lot of organic lobular almost intestinal shapes because yeah like during that experience of industrial design I also started just questioning a lot about you know a lot of the things that I was making were being made with the idea of mass manufacturing them of profitability and it was just something that I had a really hard time connecting to when I started to think about these systems we were in and finding a lot of questions and there wasn't a lot of people answering my questions and it was just like a very interesting confusing time where I had a ton of questions and I started to really utilize my art to explore these questions I was asking and it was the first time that my art had any sort of narrative or any sort of conceptual basis and it was a really exciting time in that way despite how overwhelming it was and yeah, you can see here, you know, it wasn't just confusing with school, it was just also that point in my life where the point in everyone's lives where you're a young person out in the world on your own and you're, you know, meeting people and facing a lot of social joy and a lot of social rejection and you're falling in love and you're falling out of love. And I really just started using my art as a means to express my emotions and this was just, uh, this is one of the first pieces I made that feels very true to what I'm making now. And it's one of the first pieces where this dog figure appears. It's called Doggy. I, I used a lot of visual illustration in my beginnings. And it was just kind of a celebration of that angst, I suppose, with this like monstrous dog figure. It was kind of that internal rage, but a justified rage. And it was kind of a love letter to that part of myself that questioned and that didn't, you know, take a step back from those questions and really fully embraced them. And I just really love it because this dog figure kind of follows me throughout my whole life up to this point, creating this presentation, I realized how often I used it and you'll see it again. And yeah, so I just kind of continued with that art practice throughout school. And when COVID hit, it very much was a lifeline for me exploring this time where I just had a, a lot of a lot of opportunity to really sit with those questions I had started to ask. And it was also my junior year of college. I was about to graduate and I, at that point, really realized that I wasn't going to pursue industrial design when I graduated, but I didn't really have a direction outside of that. Despite me creating all of this art, I still didn't exactly picture myself as an artist. It felt very personal and something very just internal. And so I just utilized my art to explore those things. And I also started creating these little comics it was kind of the first time I began to meld my writing and my art together, which I've also written basically my whole life, but this was the first time I started to really meld those things together. And, uh, you know, this is just a little exploration of relationship and what it means to witness another person and what it means to be witnessed, which at that time felt very rare and valuable. And I also played around with just like these bigger conceptual questions of lack of control and kind of this existential confusion and how you can find comfort in other people. A lot of my art is just a lot of question asking and not a lot of answers. This was kind of one of the few ones where I kind of did come up with an answer, but it was still kind of vague. And it was just kind of a fun exercise to create these little, little comic strips and try and create a story very quickly. And I also started to kind of play with this idea of duality in this piece it's called mother mother I was just kind of figuring out how to marry this idea of just vulnerability and how vulnerability can both 
be a bringer of great joy and also a bringer of great heartbreak and how when you open yourself up to the world, you can get overwhelmed very easily. I'm always someone that's felt a lot all of the time and it's been interesting trying to navigate when it's okay to feel certain things and when it's okay to question those feelings. And in this picture, there's two figures, um, the figure of sunlight and this open heart and this kind of existential joy. And then this figure of heartbreak and anger and yeah, kind of that existential rage and how they feel very connected and I don't feel like I came to a resolution with this piece, but just kind of playing around with the idea of what it means to disconnect them and if you can disconnect them and the consequences of doing that. And at that point, I had graduated college and my partner was still at school, so I would remain in Bellingham for another year. And like I said, I didn't really have any real direction. I was just kind of trying to figure out what it was I even wanted. And it was a period of great limbo and uncertainty. And I knew it was going to be like that prior to entering that stage. So I just kind of wanted to utilize it in its fullest of kind of not knowing, really falling into not knowing. But I was also just a very hesitant person at that point. I really didn't know what to do. And when opportunities came, I always found a way to talk myself out of them. And that really came to a head at a point when I came back home to my family's home. And, you know, when you go back home, it's especially those first years, it's kind of very easy to regress back into who you were when you knew these people the best. And for myself, that meant that I would just kind of fall back into this kind of bitter teenager who was quiet and afraid. And it felt very much like an exaggeration of just what I was feeling in that moment in general. And I realized how much I didn't need these feelings anymore. And I came back to Bellingham and created this piece, The New Moon. And in it, you see this gnarled tree, which at some point served as a foundation, but now kind of serves as a barrier between the figure on the right and the figure on the left, kind of this current version of myself and then what I want to become and you see the dog again, but this time it's standing tall and strong and looking up and kind of just wanting to utilize that strength in what I saw the dog to create more positive forward energy. And I'm setting fire to this tree, kind of a, a positive destruction, I suppose, where the ashes would then fertilize the ground. and serve for new growth. And I continued kind of on this thought line of questioning fear and questioning hesitation with this piece, what stops you from dreaming, where there's the dog again. And this piece was a lot about fear. It was about feeling empathy towards fear and how Fear, yeah, is this dog, this guardian that kind of could also turn and bite you, but it's it's ultimately something that's trying to protect you and that can see basically anything new as a threat. And in it, I'm on the ground, kind of being consumed by this forest, asleep, stagnant, and trying to wake me is this spirit of inspiration and the dogs are circling trying to fend it off because it's scary and uncomfortable but I was also thinking about how fear 
also kind of illuminates what you really care about and what you can't stand to lose. And in this moment, I felt like I was afraid because I didn't want to lose this sense that what I had to say was important and I felt like rejection would somehow taint that in some way. But that ultimately, if I never pursued my art, that no one would hear it. So it would never be important, I suppose. And I don't know, I just started to really understand that this is something that I wanted to pursue and something that I wanted to share with the world. And I got that opportunity with this mural at North Seattle College. At that point in time that this mural opportunity happened, it was about like six-ish months after I had drawn that, uh, What Stops You From Dreaming. And in that time, I moved to Seattle. I got a job. It was a really physical job. It was a job that kind of impeded on my ability to draw just because I kind of got an injury in my arm. And, you know, I was just in a, a time where it felt like I was very stuck and I didn't exactly know how to get myself out of this situation. And then I saw the call for art and it was the first time that I ever applied to anything because it just felt so, it felt like I had no excuses not to. It was, especially with the the premise of like, that I would be helped and that you know, I didn't need to have any mural experience and that there would be a team of people helping me through the process and that they were looking for an artist that was like me for a community that I was a part of. It just felt too good to be true in some ways. And I was like, I don't know, I, I went back home for Christmas and in that environment, just kind of reflected on what I had thought about the last time I was there and just decided that I couldn't be afraid anymore. So I applied and I utilized a lot of what I had been thinking about to kind of begin this story building. This was the first time I created anything for an entire community of people or representing an entire community of people. Prior to this, my art had mainly been about myself and my internal world and I knew that it was it was a big task to try and create a sort of universal story and so I looked at a lot of the indigenous mythology and creation stories from Central and South America and I was seeing this pattern of death and rebirth like the cycle of like death to life life to death there are stories of gods going into the underworld and bringing back bones and from those bones creating new worlds and you know yeah bones creating fish in the sea and just a lot of these tropes of kind of being reborn and I had been thinking a lot about change and I also found the story of the the, the Cholosquinkle that kind of is serves as a guide to people in the underworld and carries them across the river of death. And obviously I love the idea of the dog. And so I really latched on to that as a means of talking about change in a really positive way both like the kind of talking about the the migration journey that a lot of Latina people experience either themselves or from past family members, but then also talking about internal change and what it means to make those decisions that really shift the course of your life. And then also just talking about societal change as well. I was thinking a lot about that, about how a lot of these systems that are in place that hurt us, nothing will change about them until we become 
comfortable with the idea of things ending and comfortable with saying goodbye to old ideas. And so this kind of little writing on the right kind of summarizes where I ended up of, you know, riding this god beast. We search for a new home uh, where we can transform and change into kinder and more sustainable beings. And that, yeah, we need to become comfortable and active with the concept of ending. And did a lot of these sketches. I really wanted it to be clear that the dog was not leading people to death or anything, but just like the sense of transformation. So I started using these butterfly motifs and eventually I came to this final design. I just kind of wanted to showcase a few of the symbols that are in it of this sun and moon. I wanted it to be clear that neither state was negative, that the nighttime is this time of dreaming and wishing. And you see that in the shooting stars and in all the stars around the moon. Um, it's this time where we can be creative and abstract. And then you can come back into the known world of the day and make those dreams into a reality. And then you see also the Arbol de Vida, um, the Tree of Life, which I took a lot of inspiration from folk art in Central America. Of this Tree of Life motif, you would see it in sculptures and candelabras, and it kind of harkened back to like this Garden of Eden. And I wanted this like, I wanted where these people were going to to be this place of abundance and fruitfulness and kind of hearkening to that sustainable way of being. I wanted to feel like there was relation between everything there. And then I really wanted it to be clear that all of these different people were going through a state of change. They had all experienced change. I wanted it to be clear how universal a force change is. It's kind of the one thing that ties us together and I really wanted it to be this sense of change can be a constructive and positive force when it's something we engage with in each other and it's something that we see as a means of connecting to other people. I was inspired by my own life. Obviously, I think a lot of the feelings I felt about this mural kind of came through in it because it felt like this was something I would have never been able to do without knowing there would be other people around me to help guide me and to aid me and in creating it. It was also something that I thought a lot about when it came to hearing about my own parents' journey to this country, how so many of their stories about their beginnings here had to do with the people that helped them that had gone on similar journeys to them and had guidance or aid or just the time to spend with them. And just how change can create community if we allow it to. And this is the final piece in North Seattle College and yeah, it was a really beautiful experience to work with Calda and to work with all of the students who, without them, I never would have been able to do this, especially being at that it was a point in my life where I didn't feel very able physically. And so to know that I would have that help was just so fundamental to all of this process. And it really allowed me to feel able to kind of pursue this dream of just I, I suddenly knew that people wanted to hear what I had to say and see the art that I wanted to make so I applied to other public arts opportunities and I got this opportunity with the city of Tequila to design a utility box and I utilized these two pieces that I had made previously both very similar in their conception, but just kind of this idea of this kind of big cat traversing through this alien starry flowering landscape and just kind of 
being curious and finding wonder in everything. And I then ended up with this design. So search for wonder. And yeah, it's just this kind of celebration of the natural world, the world around us, what's around us in this very moment. Just really trying to be appreciative and grateful for the beauty in every moment. And after those two experiences, I kind of really got back into my own art practice. And I created this piece. It's called Death and the Instrument. And it's kind of a culmination of everything that I had been thinking about at that point in time. Yeah, just with cycles of change and duality. And I kind of created this mythology. I started becoming very interested in what it meant to create a mythology and what it meant to kind of create a symbol language. And I wanted to give time to this story that was brewing in my head. At this point in time, I think it might be a little clear, but I'm very interested in these ideas of divinity and creation. And I think that kind of comes from my background. I My parents kind of converted to Christianity before I was born and that's where I grew up in and it's not where I stayed but it definitely influenced a lot about how I view the world and trying to kind of come up with my own idea of what it means to connect to this grander universe and with these grander forces of death especially I think because death can be a very uncomfortable thing I know it's uncomfortable for me and it's something that When I really think about how much I love anything or anyone, my brain kind of just works in the way that I just realize that they'll end. And that's just very disconcerting to me. So I feel like this painting was kind of a way of me trying to get comfortable with those ideas and in some ways understand that mortality is what gives us meaning. And so I created this story of the musician and an instrument, um, the musician being death and the instrument being life and the music they create is kind of just what we experience. And while the song is being played, everything is blooming and everything's growing. And once the song ends, everything washes away and that that washing away is necessary for new things to grow. And there's this frame of this tree again, both in bloom with animals on it and then its roots in the soil with bones and worms and just kind of trying to speak to that sort of duality of life and how these two things are kind of just two sides of the same coin. And I did a lot of sketching for that as well, just really trying to perfect what this instrument would look like and what death is and who they represent and a lot of writing again so many of my pieces have this writing element that isn't always obvious in the final product but it's always there in the background and yeah I kind of continued with this creation of a mythology here in the river series it's kind of these three aspects of what it means to be in relation to ourselves and to other people and to this grander force. And there's the fountain, which is something that I was trying to embody a lot at that time of allowing myself to be fully present with others and to share and to share ideas and to be a life-giving force in as much as I could. And then there's the river, which is just this relation to everything and this idea that everything has life and spirit and that there's a way to create a connection to anything you encounter, um, even objects, I suppose, and that everything is just kind of rooted back into this kind of primal source of of life and then there's the well which is this idea that you can find a sort of vitality just in coming back into yourself and reflecting and being in that 
quiet part of your mind, which I feel like the well is a place that I've been in for a lot of my life. So I'm comfortable there, but I kind of made this triad in order to remind myself that it's important to connect to all aspects of being. And then that kind of continues into this. It's called Eden Before the Bloom. I made this piece after going to Mexico, which I hadn't been to Mexico in at that point, like 14 years or something. And I hadn't talked with that side of my family in a really long time. And it was just this moment where I had to kind of become comfortable it was like I was stepping into a new version of myself, having to get better at my rusty Spanish and kind of reintroduce myself to the side of my family. But it was also a very old version of myself. It was this past that I hadn't really been able to encounter for a really long time. And just the landscape there and the colors and even the climate, everything felt very familiar, but very different to what I was used to and I just kind of utilized those feelings to create this piece the coyote being a shapeshifter I just kind of wanted to get in touch with that side of myself that felt like I was shifting into something new and unfamiliar to me but very true to me and it felt like I was just in a moment right before something happened right before I changed. And yeah, a lot of my pieces are very much just a way for me to process the things going on in my head and almost a conversation that I have with myself. And I think it's been exciting to try and figure out ways to have that conversation with other people and to try and connect with the ideas that other people are having as well. But yeah, every piece that I make is just kind of its own little story and its own little world in that way. And recently, I've just been thinking a lot about ambiguity and this piece, Everything with Wings, was my first little delve into that, uh, the meteor being this like either cataclysmic force of destruction or just a beautiful shooting star in the sky. And this kind of ambiguity of what its purpose was and what it would lead to, but just kind of wanting to celebrate that uncertainty of where it would go and what it would lead to. And that also was present in this piece. It's called Heaven Will Change You. It was a poem first and then it became a painting. And yeah, just also calling to those ideas of, you know, is this big abstract shape in the background a explosion? Is it a cosmic tree? Is it just an abstract representation of an idea? And I thought that I would just read the poem that it was associated with to kind of end off this talk, to kind of really impress the fact that yeah every every piece that I make is in some way a story in its own sense so I think I'll just read that now yeah heaven will change you up and out the tree becomes a tower it renders the sky into heaven and the light into thread this is heaven I once said to you as we watched the sun sink under the coast this is heaven, I said, referring to the light, referring to the round pebbles and the wet logs. Under all of this, there is eternity. I am watered by it, willowed. Time combs through me like wind would. Look up and you will see these thin spirits are wisped up like grasses, that the sky is torn apart by light. And in those gaps, doorways, where those sun-white fields end and then begin again. I am full of fractures. I am wilted. I am jealous. I see those strands, see how they sag lovingly back towards earth, 
My fingers play at their edges, and I wonder what it would be like to climb with an open heart into atmosphere. But I am an animal before I am anything else. I am an animal and my heart takes up a small space in this body. Mostly I am heat and I am fear. I know nightmares and I know wounds. I know you, the way we can warm each other. I know you, the way my ear can press against your chest and find a star thrumming. I know how to lock my fingers into your hair or grip your hands tightly. And I know how to hope I can see you all the way through. I am trying so hard to look up, to only think about the oak trees and the way all that is bright breaks through every leaf. This is heaven, I once said to you, referring to all that is brittle, referring to the rocks that will one day be sand despite themselves, referring to a sun that will always give in to the dark of the water, referring to anything that will, that has to, end. And yeah, I think that's a good spot to end it. I really appreciate all of you for listening to everything that I had to say and for giving me your time. Thanks. Thank you for taking us on such an emotional ride. Um with all the connections to community, the connections um, that you made uh, throughout everything. So beautiful, thank you. I'm wondering if people have questions. And I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to tell you that you can put them in the chat too. Did you write the poem? Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I second uh, Cristobal's comment, which is, I now have two questions. One, where can we purchase your work? And two, are are you envisioning a book project in the near future, which I was thinking about too the whole time. Oh yeah, um, I, well, I guess you can purchase my work through contacting me <laughs> directly. I think I should have, there should be my social media up in the chat somewhere, um, but I can also share it as well. And then, yeah, I have thought about a book project. I have a lot of different ideas and I've been working through them for years. <laughs> I guess that's just how books go. But yeah, I definitely am thinking about uh, a book. Fanya asks, uh, what do you envision next for yourself? It's a great question. I feel like the main thing that I want to do is yeah, I'm just trying to create a more concise philosophy, I guess. I don't know. A lot of my art is very tied into the philosophy that I have. So I've been asking a ton of questions and I guess I'm just trying to come up with some answers. But yeah, I, I guess I'm just trying to come up with a, a more concise body of work. In terms of what I envision for myself, uh, in like ambition and things like that. It's always been difficult for me to picture very concrete steps, unfortunately. But I just wanna get more involved in public work. Um, I really do like the process of kind of working with entire communities and getting feedback from a lot of different people. I feel like it's a great learning experience. So I guess more public works projects, yeah. Beautiful. Anything else? Please unmute yourself if you've got questions. Grace, is there a poet or an artist that you look to often? Mm, yeah, I mean, I really like Mary Oliver. And I also really enjoy Rainer Rilke. Um, and yeah, I just, I like poets that kind of capture that like spirit, what's spiritual and life giving and just like everyday things or just like this fantastical portrayal of what is right in front of them. I think a lot of my inspiration comes from poets more so, I guess, than artists. I, I love other visual artists, but I'm always afraid of like copying things. Yeah. So I try not to look too much into it other than just to admire 
Um, but poetry is, I think, a great place to pull inspiration from. Are you able to work daily on your artwork or are you working a full-time job that makes, this is always the plight of the artist, right? Yeah, I am working a full-time job right now. Um, though I actually do enjoy, I feel like even if I was able to work on my art full-time, it's, I'm someone that really likes having a daily interaction with other people. So having a job kind of allows me to, I don't know, I have a lot of interesting conversations with other people and kind of allows me to work through ideas and get inspiration. So it's not something that I'm begrudgingly doing right now or anything. <laughs> but yeah, it is the reality. My art definitely just kind of gives me an extra little cushion at this moment in time. But I still, it's something that I try and engage with as often as I can. I have another question. Sorry if I'm... Oh yeah, go ahead. I don't, I don't see any coming up in the chat, so I'll just go forward. Um, has, working on the mural, I spent so much time, as did all the students in that class, like up against the belly of that dog or like really in the hands of those people. So the sense I picture when I think about your work, it's really on such a large scale, which was so beautiful to be immersed in that. But I know you often work in the sketchbook scale or tablet scale if you're drawing digitally. And like, did that mural experience or the uh, vinyl wraps for Tukwila like change how you're thinking about scale from the onset, like not only just the enlargement of a drawing, but like actually composing on some sort of different scale or are you thinking about that? Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely made me want to go bigger and it's definitely made me think a lot more about, I don't know, I, I think right now I'd like to do some paintings just on like cut out pieces of wood like different shapes and just kind of how a painting is framed or how a piece is framed but yeah I'm definitely thinking about different scale and just how that can lend to creating completely different segments of a piece and how those different segments can be their own worlds in that way but yeah no it was really great working on the mural because uh yeah, I have never made anything that big. And it definitely did make me have to think about like, is this readable from a distance? Like, are these details necessary? Or it's, I don't know, it was, it was, it was a fun, like logistical thing. And then I see someone asked if I'm still doing industrial design and I'm not doing industrial design. I do think that that program was really influential on me understanding the value of story though because basically every project we had to come up with the concept and storyboard it and kind of um impress and justify why we wanted to create it and I think that that's been very helpful in me creating proposals for things <laughs> just like acknowledging how much story can shift people's perception of what you're showing them like even if they yeah even if they already like it it just kind of solidifies why they like it and so I utilize that kind of that kind of storytelling a lot um, and I learned a lot of that from that program that was from an architect the architect in our midst oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I definitely appreciated it it just wasn't personally something that I could do very well but I love like in hindsight the experience was very fruitful to me okay oh when creating the mural at the college was it difficult to see other students recreating your work I don't think so mostly just because I was grateful someone was doing it <laughs> but I think there were like certain points I think like faces are hard for people to not do in their own style I think like things like trees or just like solid lines, like kind of impersonal things. It's not the, it's not that difficult to translate, but I think like human faces are so specific and we're just so good at recognizing when something looks different or like a face looks different than we were expecting that I think seeing other people draw the 
faces was probably the most like difficult part of like me being like oh that's not exactly how I was thinking they were gonna look but it was also just like a technical challenge because painting a face from that close up and not being able to see how it looks until you walk all the way like I don't know like 10 feet away from it it's like really difficult to edit on the fly or while you're there um because like I definitely I painted some of them too and I was like oh that's not how I was thinking it was gonna turn out so it was just like a technical challenge I think more so than that it was other people doing it. It was the scale was hard, but yeah, it, it was an interesting, it's always interesting when other people are kind of interpreting your work and you get to kind of see how their flourishes kind of come into it. But I wasn't against it at all. It was kind of part of the collaboration process. I love it. Thank you so much for coming and uh, just talking about your beautiful work and and, and uh, having us sort of um, be able to envision maybe our lives differently through your work um, a little bit. And I, I think um, it was just, it was transformative um, in so many ways. And um, you are going to get a beautiful chat uh, <laughs> full of people saying amazing things. And uh, hopefully you can look at it every time you're feeling a little bit uh, under the under under the weather or you know, <laughs> I'm so confident um so uh, we'll send that on to you um, okay thank you so much for coming thank you thank you everyone for being here I really really appreciate your time taking the time to listen to me and everything like that all right